الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم آمين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا يا ربنا من فضلك علما وإخلاصا وحلما يروي إمامنا يحيى ابن شرف النووي رحمة الله عليه ونفعنا الله بعلومه وبكم آمين بسنده عن أبي بكر الصديق رضي الله عنه and his name was Abdullah his father everyone knows is Abu Kuhafa Abu Kuhafa was Uthman ibn Amir and they were taming huwa wa abuhu wa ummuhu sahaba he and his mother and his father were all companions of the Prophet and of course Abu Kuhafa converts to Islam during the Fath of Mecca Abu Bakr al-Siddiq says رضي الله عنه نظرت إلى أقدام المشركين ونحن في الغار وهم على رؤوسنا I looked to the feet of the mushrikeen of Quraysh who were looking for the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and they had decided that he needed to be killed and they were in the cave outside of Mecca a thawr. and the cave is low and so they were down and the mushrikeen are walking right up high at the mouth of the cave and he said he could see their feet and if they looked down they would see our heads inside the cave because it was extremely small space فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ أَنَّ أَحَدَهُمْ نَظَرَ تَحْتَ قَدَمَيْهِ لَأَبَصَرَنَا I said messenger of Allah if one of them just looks down to his own feet, he's going to see inside the cave, right? And they're going to catch us. So, the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the final messenger to the universe, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sent to the world to bring compassion, sent with the revelation that is still intact until this day, the Qur'an. Subhanallah turns to him and confidently says, مَا ظَنُّكَ يَا أَبَا بَكْرٍ بِإِثْنَيْنِ اللَّهُ ثَالِثُهُمَا What do you think of two people? Allah is their third. Right. We're okay. In the Qur'an, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the incident saying that he said to his companion, لا تحزن إن الله معنا Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. Don't be afraid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. If you have a good friend and you're going through a hard time and that person reminds you that you're not alone, oftentimes that can really do wonders for your heart. But what if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns to you and you're stuck in a tight spot with him and he says, don't worry, Allah is with us. This is the eighth hadith in the chapter seven of Riyadh al-Salihin, Gardens of the Righteous. And the chapter is on certainty and relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here is a lesson in certainty. Here is a lesson in tawakkul. And we said last week that relying on Allah is only the fruit of certainty. It's certainty that will get you there. And when you feel that you can trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and place your affairs in the hands of Allah, now, there's only going to be peace of heart. If you want to get to that place, the course to certainty is the one to follow, to increase that certainty. How does certainty increase? Certainty is a gift, first and foremost, that's given by Allah. You can't snap your fingers, you can't buy it off the shelf. 
but if you want it, you can get there. And the first way to certainty is to engage in your prayers. To have moments of intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To recite the Qur'an, right? Just recite and recite away. Be with the Qur'an because you're reciting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are a balsam, they are a salve for the heart that puts the heart at rest. If you get anxious reciting the Qur'an, right, will bring your heart to a stillness. Certainty itself comes from yaqana, which is to be still, not to be fluttering around. There are many ways to certainty. And there are as many ways to certainty as there are people who need to get there. For some, it's when they find their dua that they just made being answered, something that they've asked for, and when it happens, they know that this is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's some peculiar people who might even increase in certainty from rational theology, right? But that's a small group. Oftentimes, we go to rational theology for the wrong reasons and we don't understand the effect that it's supposed to have, uh, the benefit that comes from it. Uh, making remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making your occasional supplications, being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as possible, following the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. Now, SubhanAllah. And of course, going back to the theology, understanding who Allah is and who the slave is. Understanding the difference between the infinite and the finite. SubhanAllah. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Lo kushifa anni al hijab, la mazdad tu yaqeena. The veil between me and the unseen was rent. In this moment, I would not increase one iota in certainty. Right? He was already there. He was already there. When they first go into the cave, Abu Bakr goes in first, radiallahu anhu. And he makes an incredible effort to make sure that it's safe from any type of scorpions or snakes or any other of these harmful animals in the desert. Right? He lays out his own cloak for the Messenger والسلام, He arranges himself uh, so that the Messenger can uh, use him as a wisada, as a pillow, so he can get some rest because they have a long journey on foot huh, to get to Medina uh, in the coming days. And when the Quraysh are looking for them, Abu Bakr is distraught with fear and anxiousness. And not because he's afraid for himself, but he's worried for the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Sahaba used to say, Ruhi fidaka ya Rasulullah. Or fidaka, yani may my soul be uh, sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. Or May my parents be sacrificed for you. And for an Arab to say such a thing, he said, Huh? Bi abi anta wa umni ya Rasulullah. Huh? Aw fidaka abi wa umni ya Rasulullah. For an Arab to say such a thing is a huge thing indeed. For anyone to say such a thing for the most part. But the Arabs, right? Everything that they are, their entire identity comes singularly from their parents. Right, in that way. So it's a big deal for them to say that. But here, look at Abu Bakr is afraid for the messenger. He's just left his family with absolutely nothing, okay, except Allah and his messenger, uh, which is Allah, which is absolutely everything. They say, Kullu Sayyid fi Jawfil Farah, right? Uh, farah is like a wild mule in the desert, uh, and for some reason, it was a big deal to catch a wild mule, right? Um, but the Arabs had a saying that if you get this fara animal while you're out hunting, you've got everything, right? So they'll say, even about something as, something as uh, great as this, right? Everything is in this, right? That's effectively what that saying is. So he left everything to them, but nothing. 
And Abu Qahafa is still not a Muslim yet. He comes to the door and he says, Your father is not taking care of you. He's irresponsible. He's chasing after this Muhammad. Alayhi salatu was salam. I'll bet he didn't leave you anything. And what does Asma do? Right? She says, No, Abu Qahafa was blind. Come here, Jiddi. Come here, grandfather. And he takes him to where Abu Bakr used to keep the money and she piled up a whole bunch of sand under the carpet where they used to keep all of the money and put his hand there and he said, okay, well at least he left you with something. Right? That's better than nothing. And later Abu Quhafa would become Muslim at the special invitation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of his concern for Abu Bakr and wanting to see his companion be happy. But look at this hem that Abu Bakr has He's having this hem or this concern for someone other than himself. He's able to put himself aside here for Rasulullah which of course is the right maqam and many of us insha'Allah would not find such a problem. Were we there? Insha'Allah. We hope and it's okay to hope. And it's okay to dream about being there with the Messenger There's no such thing as needing to, you know, scold yourself about saying, I wish that I was there with the Prophet as some people have said. Right? Because you wouldn't be able to match up and keep up if you saw Rasulullah right? You would change your condition from beginning to end. You'd be fine. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our dreams and most importantly when we need his intercession on the inevitable day of judgment at the end of times. Subhanallah. But still there is this understanding of empathy, being able to be concerned for another that has nothing to do with the benefit that you're going to accrue for yourself. Being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and think about the world and life from the perspective of another person. This is incredibly important. This is incredibly important. Society cannot uh, continue. Uh, we can't survive unless there's a certain number of people around us who know how to think of to take themselves out of themselves for a moment because we know we want the whole world to orbit around ourselves as individuals but to take oneself out of oneself for a moment and think about what the world must look like from the shoes of another and that can take a lot of effort these others come from where? they come from cultures neighborhoods circumstances that one of us may never have seen before. But something even more important for us to consider when thinking about the eyes of another or seeing the eyes, the world through the eyes of another is that we really don't know where people come from oftentimes. And we should be careful about assuming because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will just show us over and over again how wrong we can be about our assumptions. So if we have enough self-awareness to know that we can have to be careful not to assume we can understand the otherness of the other, what then is there to do if we want to be a person of compassion? Because there is no compassion without empathy. Listen. Right? Listen. As our parents and grandparents said, Allah didn't give you two ears for no reason, right? And one mouth, right? So shut the one mouth and open the two ears. And just listen to people and learn. SubhanAllah. That's what your soul exists for. Your soul exists to learn. Your soul exists to learn. Your soul is nourished by learning and enriching and deepening in meaning. The world of meaning is beyond the world of physical things. Physical things or even the letters of words are just vessels that convey or carry meaning that is available to human souls. 
because it's only human souls that can access meaning. That's why your soul exists. MashaAllah. What do you think of two people, Allah is their third? And in the ninth hadith from Umm al Mu'minina, Umm Salama, wa ismuha Hindu bint Abi Umayya, Hudayfa al Makhzumiya. So Umm Salama, right, was from Bani Makhzum, radiallahu anha. أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان إذا خرج من بيته قال بسم الله توكلت على الله. طيب. We can go through many reasons why the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام had many wives. Or, and we can become very creative in coming up with reasons. Right? And we've all heard the different reasons and justifications for the Prophet ﷺ having multiple wives and so on. Or we could just use Akam's razor and look at the immediate benefit to us. We find out about all aspects of what he's doing in his home, in his most private moments. SubhanAllah. And they are the ones who convey this to us. They are ulama, they are scholars. She says, radiallahu anha, that the Prophet والسلام, when he would leave his house, he would say, Bismillahi tawakkaltu ala Allah. He makes a positive declaration that he is relying on Allah. I rely on Allah. Not, oh Allah, make me of the people who trust you enough to rely on you. Khalas, it's a done deal. So confident. Right? And for the Prophet والسلام, the reliance on Allah for him is an open book. It's clear as day. That's where he's at. He would not think otherwise. Like we saw when the man stands over him with his own sword in his hand ready to strike him and everyone around him is asleep under the trees. He says, who's going to protect you from me now, Muhammad? And he says, well, Allah is. And it shocked the man so much that he dropped the sword. But for us, when we walk out of the house and we say, Bismillahi tawakkaltu ala Allah, right? And we make that statement, we're reinforcing it to ourselves and making a claim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of confidence that both we have to live up to, but we also declare our commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the certainty and confidence that he will have our back when we leave the home that day. Bismillahi, I rely on Allah. By the name of Allah, I rely on Allah. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an adilla aw udalla. O Allah, I seek refuge in you that I go astray or I lead others astray. Well, there's another facet of empathy. Not only am I concerned about myself, but I don't want to do damage to others as well. Aw azilla aw uzalla, or here adilla aw udalla, that I lead, that I go astray or am led astray by another, or azilla aw uzalla, that I slip up or someone causes me to slip and fall or slip and fall, because there's different ways of slipping and falling, right? Someone might slip and fall and scrape their knee, and someone might slip and fall and lose everything they hold dear. Allah protect us. Allah protect us from those who might do us harm intentionally or unintentionally and protect us from ourselves and the harm that we might do to ourselves intentionally or unintentionally. That I oppress another person or another person oppresses me. Or Or that I, there's two ways to understand this. That I do something out of ignorance or fall into ignorance of something that I need to know, or people misunderstand me, that I fall into misunderstanding or misunderstand something that I need to know, or I am misunderstood by others, 
And then there's the alternative meaning of jahl in Arabic, which is, I lose my temper, right? That I lose my temper or someone lose their temper with me, right? Both of them, right, can work here. And both of them, both of those situations come from ignorance. Now, Allah, subhanAllah, it's a beautiful dua. Hadith number 10. An Anas radiallahu anhu qala qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam man qala yani ila kharaja min baytihi bismillah tawakkaltu ala Allah. Anas ibn Malik also who worked in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa sallam said Whoever says when leaving his house, Bismillahi, by the name of Allah, tawakkaltu ala Allah, I rely on Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, and there is no ability or strength except from Allah, yuqalu lahu, it will be said to him, yani by the angels, hudita wa kufita wa wuqita, you have been guided, you have been taken care of, or sufficed, Right, and you have been protected. وَتَنَحَّى عَنْهُ shaytan And the shaytan will stay away from him. Will get out of his way, really what it means. Will move over, right, as he walks through the Turukat. Yeah, Rabbi, who doesn't need that? Now, Kudita wa kufita wa wuqita. MashaAllah. Hadith number 11, also on Anas. رضي الله عنه قال كان أخواني على عهد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وكان أحدهما يأتي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم والآخر يحترف There were two brothers during the time of the messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام One of them would come and learn from the messenger, the prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and the other would make a living working in the market. So the one who worked in the market complained to the Prophet about his brother. And he said, Maybe the success that you have in your work and the money that you bring in to take care of your family and to provide for him and his family as well. Maybe that success you have and that money you get comes to you because of what he's doing, not what you're doing. Because we also believe that la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no ability and there is no power except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the razaq, Allah is the sustainer. It's just that we expect to find the sustenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we put in effort and work. If you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide for you, or if you want provision, first you ask of the one who provides. And then you go out and make an effort. And you work. But the tawfiq comes from Allah. Look at the world. Some people do all the right things. And they put in all of the efforts. And they sweat and they put in years. They never get that promotion. Or they never get that career path that they were looking for. And other people don't really do much of anything at all. And all of a sudden everything goes right for them. It's calm, precision, ihsan, doing excellence, making an effort. Whoever goes to sleep at night, worn out and exhausted from the work of his own hand, her own hand, goes to sleep at night, forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want this, you go out and you get it. If Allah has put you in a different situation with a different calling, Maybe you have a different set of circumstances. But ultimately, we get into Jannah not by our own effort, but by the Rahmah of Allah. It's just that you expect to find the Rahmah of Allah where? 
you stick to your ibadat and your devotions and you do right by Allah and He does right by you. We are healed when we get sick by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not by the medicine and not by the doctors, but where you expect to find the healing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is where you respect the nature of his sunan or his ways of setting up the universe and you betake yourself to the medication and you betake yourself to the specialist care. But ultimately as a believer you know that Allah is the only power and the only creator who brings about change or sustains in the universe. And the same here with our provision. We make our best efforts and then we, we, ex we, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge of the results. And he said to him, you complain that he's just sitting all day learning from in the masjid, but maybe the food that you're able to bring home to put in your family's mouth only comes to you because of what he's doing. Because at the end of the day, we also need barakah. But these people thought, huh? on a whole different metaphysical level. They thought about the world and the reality of the universe at a more realistic level than the way we think. Right? We're all wrapped up in the Protestant work ethic and industrialization, corporatization, and all of these, uh, what is it, radical capitalism, uh, heartless capitalism that would trample over souls to make a dollar or send souls out to be destroyed while they destroy other souls in order to maintain right, different economic positions in the universe or in the world. Ya Rabbi. Allah marzukna. Allah sustain us. Allah give us our sustenance. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That is Baab al Yaqeen wa Tawakkul. We have time, I believe. Uh, before we start Babel Istiqama, do we have any questions or anything like this? Say it. Uh, on your point about um, like hard work doesn't guarantee success, mm -hmm. um, is it still, is it a bad need? But it's where you expect to find success. Okay. So the Sunni, right, puts in the hard work and figures out how to do the right hard work and makes all of that effort, but witnesses that the reward, the results, will ultimately come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it doesn't mean that we dismiss hard work. It's a mashhad, imani. It is a witness of faith, right? We can blame ourselves for if we figure out that we could have done things differently or better, and we learn from our mistakes, right? Uh, we work as if it is this hard work that is going to bring about the result, but because that's what it looks like to Bani Adam. It looks like it's the work that you put in, or maybe luck, huh? But good fortune being in the right place at the right time, and so on and so forth. But we witness that the dynamics are much bigger than that, and we see this disconnect there is a disconnect between the work put in and the results that come, but it is only something that we witness with our hearts and know with our hearts. No. But go ahead, say it, finish. So I guess um, when doing hard work, is it a bad idea to want to try to be the best at what you're doing? Like you want to be the best basketball player or academic or engineer mm -hmm. as part of your idea for working really hard that you want to be known as... Would it, would it be great at what you're doing and stuff like that? Or one of the best? So well, right. look. There is greatness at what we're doing that has to do with the itqan and the precision with which we do it. And then there's competition. Who's number one and who's number two? Some of that is harmless, so long as it's not hurting anyone. Right? Uh, so long as it's not hurting anyone. If people um, have the ambi uh, uh, ambition, right, to be out there uh, uh, performing highly in their particular career uh, or um, work of choice, that's natural to people. 
but can they be ethical while they do it? It becomes the question. And then seeking after the fame and the shuhra, there, these things come naturally. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives recognition to who He wills. And He will often give it to people who aren't seeking it. Right? Um, seeking it for itself or for its own right, for the adulation that we might receive uh, in return. We understand this and we can be compassionate with a person who's suffering through these needs. That's an important perspective on it. Uh, but still, there's an emptiness there if people feel that they're not whole until they have the adulation of people around them. Right? And that emptiness needs healing. SubhanAllah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants true recognition to whoever He wills. Sidna Shaykh Mullah Ramadan uh, from Bhutan in the south of Turkey uh, you know went to Damascus in exile and he was a Shafi'i Faqih and uh, taught many other disciplines he was the father of Dr. Saeed Ramadan of Bhuti, who rahmatullahi alayhi became a world renowned extremely fit. the Mormons used to bring him here to America to their conferences you know, all over the world he was uh, recognized and he raised generations of incredible uh, thinkers Islamically with the tools of traditional and grounded Islam and he showed how they could operate in the, in the contemporary world. Um, Sheikh Bulla did not want Dr. Saeed to be famous. He didn't want him to become known because he saw that there was going to be a lot of trouble from that. Whether it's jealousy or having the you know the government come down on you, you know recognition can often not bring a lot of good, and nor is it very pious. And Sheikh Mullah was very very pious, very humble but confident, right, uh, uh, and courageous. But he didn't want Dr. Saeed to become famous. The interesting thing about Dr. Saeed, though, he didn't want to be famous either. He loved writing and he wanted to write his books. Uh, to his dying day, right, all he cared about was getting time to write, especially uh, even before he retired. Um, and, uh, but the thing is, is that he never pursued the means to fame. He never looked for it, he never desired it, but it came to him anyway. You know? Allah gives it recognition to who he wants. And being able to see that and deal with it is a part of spiritual maturity. No. Anyone else? Babul Istiqama, chapter 8, the chapter of uprightness in deen, religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Fastaqim kama umirt. Be upright as you are commanded. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ famously says, Shayyabetni hud wa akhawatuha. The chapter of hud in the Quran and the other chapters that contain this verse cause my hair to turn white. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded, be upright as you are commanded. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that in the Quran. Which is a very frightening thing. Yeah. Allah marzuqna istiqamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also about istiqama or uprightness in religion, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Those who said, Our Lord is Allah, and then were upright, تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ The angels will come down upon them, right? Will be with them. 
that you not fear, that you not be sad, whatever she rule, and that you take good tidings, biljannati, that the garden will be yours, allati kuntum tu adun, that you were promised, nahnu awliya'akum, the angels say to them, we are your allies, we're standing beside you. Fil hayatid dunya wa fil akhirah in this life and the next. Walakum tiha ma tashtahi anfusakum and you have there in that next life what your souls desire. Walakum fiha ma tadda'oon and you will have anything that you ask for. Nuzulan, a gift. Min ghafoorin rahim from an ever forgiving, ever gentle God. Allah marzukna. Allah make us one of those people. Right? Allah make us one of those people. With all the conditions that are required to be one of those people. The full package deal we're asking. And that's not hard for him to do. Ghasbin anna. Right? Even against our own wishes. Or the wishes of our, of our own egos. Right? Make it happen. Rahma ulufina. Right? Even if it means rubbing our noses in the dirt, the arrow said. Right? Make it happen. SubhanAllah. We can make dua against our own desires, against ourselves. Right? Because we know what ourselves would like to do. We know what ourselves want. Right? But we know what's, our aqal knows what's better. Right? So sometimes you can do an end run on your ego. Right? By putting it in situations that stuff happens that it may not choose for itself. And we can also ask Allah to be gentle with us in the process. SubhanAllah. Right? It doesn't hurt. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ Verily, those who say, Our Lord is Allah and then are upright there is no fear for them. Walahum yahzanun, and they will not be saddened. Ulaika ashabul jannah, they will be the the company of the garden. Khalidina fiha, lasting in there forever. Jaza and a reward bima kanu yamalun, a reward for what they used to do. No, a reward for what they used to do. A reward for what they used to work. So there is the ithbat, the affirmation of work that went on, but the reward, and an affirmation of a reward, but that reward comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who gives as He wishes. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those whose work He's pleased with, enough to make us of those who He rewards, not of those people who do all types of righteous deeds and righteous works, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still not pleased with them. Because they're two different things. They're two different things. Allah protect us from ourselves. Ya Rabbi. And the first hadith of the chapter, وَعَنَ أَبِي عَمْرٍ وَقِيلَ أَبِي عَمْرَةَ Sufyan ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu qal qultu ya rasulullah i said o messenger of allah qul li fil islam qawlan la as'alu anhu ahadan ghayrak tell me something about islam that i couldn't learn from anyone other than you and he said qul amantu billahi thumma astaqim Say, I believe in Allah, and then be upright. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. But uprightness is a process and a project. It has so many dimensions. There's the uprightness of the body. There's the uprightness of the heart. There's the uprightness of the mind. And all of them have multiple dimensions, and it's a life's project. And we have to work for it. We have to long for it. 
We have to know that we want it with certainty and ask Allah for success in it. But know that the only one that is perfect is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an absolute sense. And the only one after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has perfection in a qualified sense, بِالتَّقِيدًا مُقَيِّدًا Right? Is the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. We never arrive to perfection. We just get closer to it incrementally. And we want to be vigilant having that muraqaba that we looked at in earlier chapters. Muraqaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing that He sees us and muraqaba of ourselves looking for where we can improve and do better. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that tomorrow is better than yesterday. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our tomorrow is better than our yesterday. Not that our tomorrow is better than so-and-so's tomorrow, or is more like so-and-so's today, or that our yesterday, right, at least it wasn't like so-and-so, it's us and Allah. We have to stop looking and seeing what the other people are doing. It's us and Allah, and I have a journey to Allah. And so-and-so has a journey to Allah, and they're not linked. They're not the same until one of us starts harming the other, or one of us asks the other for help, and then they might link up and decouple, right? Uncouple, right? Uh, from here to there, and so on. But the choices that I make uh, are my choices, and sometimes they impact others or have to do with others. But at the end of the day, the narrative and the story is mine, and sometimes you find someone that helps you get there, that helps you along the way, fellow travelers. And they're also gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Provision, zad, balagh, to get you to where you're, you need to get to. The second hadith of the chapter on Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu qal qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qaribu wa saddidu wa alamu annahu lan yanjua ahadun minkum bi amali khalas This hadith is the qualifier of all of the things that came before this is the chapter of uprightness in religion it's not a situation where you snap your finger fingers and after this everyone is supposed to be perfect and we're going to sit there like this on the sidelines and see who passes, who we pass, give a pass to and who doesn't. No one's sitting there with the cards, right, holding up the cards at the end to see how many points you got on dancing with the stars or dancing with the Muslims, even though it feels like a dance way too often, right, and there's a lot of judges. Be upright, meaning work in this process and, huh? develop this. That's the destination where you're going. And it's not for us to judge who's gotten there or not, because ultimately we don't know what's inside people's hearts. We don't know that this person is nowhere close, and we don't know that this person has their foot in the door of Jannah. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. And what are we doing looking over at this and looking over at that? But because we know of ourselves that we fall short, we shouldn't also become delusional that it would sure be better if maybe we could switch up the teachings of the Deen of Islam and make them different. Make them more in harmony with what my particular ego wants and the egos of my friends. No. Or say that istiqama is not an objective to be achieved. Let's just say that istiqama is something that is amazing and beautiful and serene and razin and has its razana. Huh? And I fall short. But one day, inshallah, I'll get there because I love it and I love its true people. And I wish to be there. And I want to move in that direction. Rather than say that that's just not an objective. It is an objective. Huh? And the believer is the one who wants to get there. Subhanallah. We don't snap our fingers and then everybody is perfect, expected to be perfect. And here, Abu Huraira says that the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, 
karibu wa sadditu. Get as close as you can and try to be as precise and correct as you can. Make an effort to get as close to the mark as you can. Huh? And know that not a single one of you will attain salvation by his own works, by his own amal, by her own efforts. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives to who He wants. But if that's the gift that you want, is being free and clear at the, after the end of time or after the end of your moment on the face of the earth, then the place where you expect to find it is in making a sincere effort to do as well by Allah as you can. In another narration, that's attributed to the Messenger والسلام, He says, Siru ila Allahi urjan wa makasir. Travel to Allah even if broken and crippled. Huh. Another narration says, Don't wait for good health because waiting for good health is like being suspended without any action or being jobless or unemployed. Right? Ta'ala. Right? Siru ila Allahi arjan wa makasir. Get to Allah as you are. Don't say I'm not ready yet. Don't say when I turn 40. Right? Don't say keto a keto a kate. Right? What's keto a keto a kate in English? Such and such and something like that. Right? Don't say these things. Just do what you can. And if all you can do is when you wake up in the morning is to just look at the ceiling and say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Huh? That's something. That's all you can do. Just don't let the rope between you and Allah be severed. Huh? Don't give up. Don't get cynical. Cynicism is, huh? What is it in cardiac medicine when part of the heart you get the jelta, whatever that is, I think it's a stroke or something like that, right? You get the jelta and part of the heart remains like hard and knotted up. Cynicism is the same thing, right? Part of the heart dies with cynicism. Don't let yourself fall into cynicism, right? Because it's loss of hope, right? Never give up on Allah, huh? Because Allah doesn't give up on you. And that's a gift that deserves a little bit of shukr. They said in response to the Messenger, Wala anta ya Rasulullah, and not you either, you won't get into Jannah by your actions. And he said, Wala ana, and not me either. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yataghammadani bi rahmatin. Unless he covers me, envelops me in his mercy huh? from him and his bounty. No. Subhanallah. Imam al Nawawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, says, Al Muqaraba, he said, Qaribu wa saddidu. Al Muqaraba is al qastu ladi la hulu wa fihi wa la taqseer. Getting near is muqaraba in this way is an intention, a resolve, or to intend in a direction that doesn't involve uh, extremism or uh, utterly falling short to the point of not caring at all. And sadad being precise is al istiqama wal isaba, right? Is being upright and hitting the targets. Yeah. What is sadid? Sadid is aim for the center, for the bullseye, right? Aim for exactly what you're firing toward. Yeah. What time is Aisha? The Iqama? Here? Nine o'clock. What's that? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock.
Inshallah. So we stopped with 10 minutes to go, and we're uh, at the opening of the ninth chapter. Babu tafakkur fi 